Um, before I begin, I do just want to lay out one of those fun trivia moments that it is distinctly possible that within this week's Parshat Korach, we actually find the beginning of the hint of the name of our congregation. Um, because it is within this parsha that Aaron's staff begins to blossom. And while it does not explicitly say Pirkei Kodesh in that moment, they are referenced in later texts as the holy blossoms that come from Aaron's staff. And so I thought that was worth mentioning uh, as a brief little moment of Torah before diving back into insurrection and betrayal. Kol ha'eda kulam gdoshim. All of the community of God, everyone is holy. As far as heresy goes, it's not so bad. Because these are, as Rabbi McCarroll taught us earlier, the words of Korach, the grand rebel of Torah, whose story we are reading this week. He is this Levite prince. It's important to note a cousin to Moses. And the insurrection that he leads captures the hearts and minds of many in the Israelite community. But... As seductive as his argument is, it can't actually be the entirety of the truth. We know this from context, because God's actions are in such violent rebuke to this argument. The earth itself swallows Korah up and all that follow him. And we know, we must know, that a fair and just-minded God and a Torah that serves as the source of wisdom and compassion does not punish those who are expressing valid, differing opinions from their leaders and teachers, because there wouldn't be any Jews left if that was the case. And therefore, our rabbinic ancestors are unable to accept that Korach and his arguments have the same meaning on the surface as they do in their depths. Words have meaning, yes, but cultural understanding and context are necessary. And here is an example that I'm sure everyone in this room will instantly understand. Imagine for a moment that you are part of a team and that you are working hard, working night after night to complete a project. And so you as team leader might try to motivate the people around you and you might unknowingly draw from a sports metaphor. metaphor. We're almost at the finish line. You might use some kind of journey-related language. Ah, look, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. And if things are particularly grim, you might even quote poetry saying, it is darkest before the dawn. But even though it might apply, you would never utter the phrase, work will set you free. And you would certainly never say it in German. Because words, words carry worlds inside of them. Kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim, all of the community of God, everyone is holy. It sounds innocent and it sounds good, agreeable, democratic, inclusive. But we also know there must be something wrong with the how or the why or the who of that statement. We know that there is something sinister here. And our rabbis of blessed memory spill a lot of ink over many pages in a search for understanding. As Rabbi McCarroll pointed out, Rashi has many things to say, but one piece that he brings is a mashal, a proverb about a disloyal prince and a loving king. He says, every time the prince strays away and offends his father, loyal friends to the king try and reunite the two. But after the fourth time that the prince turns his back on the king, the friends realize there's not much more that they can do. Israel sins with the calf. Moses implores. They sin with grumbling and whispering. Moses prays. And just last week, they sinned by following the advice of the spies. And even here too, Moses speaks on their behalf. But here is the fourth time. And Amar Rashi, Korach comes with disloyalty and a selfish desire to rule, and Moses falls on his face. How often can I go and bother the Holy One? Blessed be God. 
The Gur Arye in Sforno see the issues of Korach and his band as a separate issue than general Israelite stiff-neckedness. The Gur Arye, in fact, says that this isn't even a targeted coup at all. It is rather purely an attempt to usurp the Kohenic line, the line of priests which will come from Aaron. Every nation needs a leader, and Moses is ours, says Korach in the voice of the rabbi. But where has Moses gone astray? By establishing Moses' own family as the family of the priesthood. Kol ha'eda kedoshim, all of us are holy, anyone can do the job. And where is my proof? Well, according to the Sforno, it's actually you, Moses, you're the proof. You aren't a Kohen, you're not Aaron's son, but you made sacrifices in the tabernacle. Therefore, if a Levite who's not a Kohen can do it, well, says Korach, I'm a Levite and I'm not a Kohen. Perhaps I should be the one leading the priesthood. Rebbeinu Bachya sees a different tangent on this argument, though, and thinks that Korach is after more than that, perhaps ultimate power, and that Korach, like many people who have found a corrupt desire in themselves, is beginning to project it onto those who have not done anything wrong. According to Rabbeinu Bachya, do not read Kulam Kedoshim, all are holy, as a reference to all of Israel, but only in reference to the firstborn Israelites. God earlier says, every firstborn must be made holy. And yet, says Korach once again, Moses... You're not firstborn, but you've placed yourself in a very important role. I, Korah, however, am firstborn. Perhaps then, I should be the one leading this people. Another stage, the Chizkuni agrees, but says, no, 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 don't just look to Korah, look to who is beside him. Yes, he is a firstborn of the Levites, but Datan and Abiram are firstborn sons of Reuben, the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn. So perhaps, Kol Ha'eda Kulam Kedoshim is a rallying cry to overthrow the entire structure of leadership, bring back the royal family, as it were, the primogenitor line of Reuben, not these upstart Levites and their Benjamite friend, Joshua. And finally, the Orha Chaim disagrees entirely and says, none of the above. This is simply a populist uprising. Demagoguery aimed at minimizing the accomplishments of Moses by praising the common man in his stead. Kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim, all of the community is holy. God is with us, Moses, not with you. God is with us in the wilderness because of our merit, Moses, not because of yours and Aaron's. He clearly hasn't been reading the Torah lately. Therefore, let us, the common man, be permitted in every sacred space and every sacred role. Kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim. All of the community, everyone, is holy. What is it then? Is it a caste system battle for the right to be God's messenger, a fight between royal tribes, a populist uprising, an apologetic? Or is it simply the last straw that throws open the deep pains of a traumatized community. As with many rabbinic commentaries, there is no singular correct answer. Instead, though, we need to point out that the collective wisdom of our people is clear. The motto contains pious words, but they are not spoken with holy intent, and they do not have sacred intentions. Words carry worlds inside of them. And simple slogans often carry hidden ideologies. I have been thinking a lot lately about slogans and about Korach, especially as I watch the news. News that comes from Ukraine, news that comes from the United States, and news that comes from Israel. In Ukraine, it's no secret that the Russian media has used the slogan of 
denazification as a polite fiction for its invasion. And in fact, in May, the Russian spokesman, Sergei Lavrov, doubled down that denazification and attacking a state led by a Jewish president are separate e issues because, and I quote, the most ardent anti-Semites are usually Jews, end quote. I doubt that there is a person in this room who isn't attracted on some level to the idea of denazification. So much of our post-World War II Jewish life and identity is rooted in memorializing the experience of the Holocaust, but also in battling attempts to forget it, minimize it, or repeat it. But when we get past the slogan, we realize very quickly that what the Jewish community and what the Russian government mean when they talk about denazification are not the same thing. As Jews, we want to see the world denazified because we are ultimately in a zero-sum game. Either they will exist or we will. But for the Russian government, the classification of Nazi is a pleasant slogan for political will. Meanwhile, in the United States of America, there is currently a battle defining religion in public schools and how the separation of church and state should function. Joe Kennedy, a public high school coach in Bremerton, Washington, has for many years led personal, private, pregame prayers on the 50-yard line. And his right was this week defended by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. As a religious community, as a religious person, I would hope that you would join me in being vigorously pro-personal and private prayer. And yet, once again, when we get past the soundbite slogan, we find that these quote-unquote personal and private prayers often included anywhere between 50 to 200 people. The team, the participants, the well-wishing fans, and now ideologically associated political allies. To me, a personal private prayer means having the freedom to express the spiritual longing which is innate to the human spirit. But down in Bremerton, it seems that personal private prayer is the free reign to reinforcing Christian dominance in the American public sphere. And in Israel, this week as the Bennett-Lapid Unity Coalition comes to an end, and Israel returns to elections for the fifth time in three years, there are, of course, all sorts of grand slogans and claims coming from every corner of society. Some are minimizing the very real failures and challenges of the last government, while others go the exact opposite way and blame it for the multitude of global issues which stem from far beyond Israel's borders. And around an election, we always expect political rhetoric. But there are lines and there are norms which have lately been blurred in the Jewish state. In recent months, entire parties and politicians throughout the Knesset have voted directly against their own ideals and directly against their own constituents, all in the name of keeping this past coalition together or breaking it down. And Times of Israel editor David Herzog has already warned that this upcoming election will be the least traditional and most bad faith election in Israeli history, as more people will cast votes out of gut feeling than fact and personal connection to or exhaustion with a candidate than in any amount of national interest. Bad faith. Ultimately, that's what this week's Torah portion is about. It is about bad faith and bad faith arguments. Arguments which appear to be reasonable, logical, ethical, aligned with our own interests, ideals, and yet, and yet, we understand somehow, deep in ourselves, 
But something is being twisted. And if you have ever been on the receiving end of such an argument, you know the feeling. You can see it coming. You can sense it, that gotcha moment, often right before it is sprung. And that gotcha is ultimately based on the intentional misunderstanding, the narrowing or expanding of a few words so that they go far beyond their original scope. Removed from nuance, painted in broad strokes, these are words that mean whatever they need to at whatever moment it serves the speaker, which is, of course, in direct opposition to what I've been saying today. Bad faith arguments are words that are empty of the world's inside of them. Bad faith arguments, then, must be met as Korach was, with honesty and with transparency, with ideological clarity, with nuance, with sincerity, all the things that they lack. And I am reminded of a prayer from the Mishkan Tefillah, the Reform Movement prayer book, which is a creative understanding of our prayer for the study of Torah. And the author writes, we seekers of God, how do we find you? In good deeds and in the study of Torah. And in your search for us, where do you find us? You find us in the bending of the knee, in the rigor of study, in the honesty of commerce, in a good heart and through decency, in respect, true fellowship, companionship, love, truth, and peace, and in the no that is really a no, and the yes that is really yes. And this is the redemptive power of Torah. Because when we live in such a way, when we live with Torah at our core, then indeed the words of Korach are no longer a bad faith trap waiting to spring. Some kind of sinister agenda. Instead, they can become the truth of our world. When our words speak the no that is really a no, and when we speak the yes that is really a yes, well then, kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim, all of the community of God, all of us are holy. Together, let us strive for such a world. Shabbat shalom.